All right, it's time for our next panel. I had a, I wanted to make a couple of announcements before I turn it over to the panel. Uh, one is about continuing legal education credit. If you want it for today, you uh, not only have had to have signed in when you arrive, you have to sign out when you leave in order to be eligible for credit. Uh, also on the, the panel, the last panel of the day, not this one, uh, I was asked to make the announcement that Steve Molo is not going to be able to be with us. And so we're sorry about that. Uh, but between then and now, I'm very excited to uh, welcome our next panel that will be moderated by Alan Zimmerman, who serves as one of our board of advisors for the Center on Civil Justice. And thank you, Alan. Turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to remind the panelists we have microphones and try to make sure you speak into the microphone because there are people somewhere in, in cyberspace also trying to hear what we're saying. Um, so just preliminarily, having just experienced this uh, very, very exciting, energetic uh, panel, um, you're gonna find this more meditative than we've had in the okay? I want you to know, we're gonna bring it down, the energy level down. Uh, we have a panel of people that basically know one another and work together on a regular basis. So, and, and we're not gonna be taking, we're not gonna be talking about whether this is good or bad. We're gonna be talking about, this is what's going on in the area of, of insurance, risk, syndication, and, and risk management capital markets in the litigation finance space and sort of what's how we got here and what's going on now, which I think you'll find fascinating and interesting because it's one of the most creative areas, in my view, of litigation finance today. And it's expanding the amount of money available and to some degree, uh, bringing down the cost of litigation finance for funders and also for for the, uh, uh, the our customers, if you will, whether it's the clients, the uh, the plaintiffs, or, or or the law firm. So, um, I also want to compliment the center. I'm to be a, a member of the the, man, the board of advisors of the center, and uh, the center's really brought together the people who are the the innovators and the creators and the practitioners of these techniques, uh, people who know one another, work together on a regular basis, and each one has a little di dis different discipline. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce them to you uh, and give you a little preliminary discussion about sort of frame where, how this fits into the things we're discussing fits into litigation finance and the whole process. And then we're going to open it up to discussion, and it's going to be hopefully and integrate, we're not gonna each give speeches, we're gonna each be talking to among ourselves and with you on some of the different topics here. And then we're gonna to get to some scenarios, some practical scenarios of how this really rises in the real world. And we'll leave some time if I time this properly so we get time for questions at the end. So I, as I said, I'm Alan Zimmerman and uh, I practiced law for 22 years in the Bay Area and somehow I managed in 1994 to get into the litigation finance space. And that's another question, another story. I won't get into that. Um, but uh, uh, I've been in this, this space a long time. It's changed dramatically, obviously, in that period of time. I'm no longer, uh, although it says on the program, I'm with Liti uh, Law Finance Group. I'm no longer, quote, Law Finance Group. I am a consultant to Law Finance Group now, and I'm the managing partner of Law Finance Group Holdings, which um, is the general partner of a number of, of investment funds that hold significant amount of, of litigation assets. So I'm we're not I'm not in any longer involved in putting these deals together, but I'm, I'm a consultant to that. Okay, uh, Boris Zeiser, um, who's sharing the middle here, uh, also a graduate of NYU Law School, um, is a partner at Schulte Roth and Zabel here in New York. And if those of you don't know that firm, it's one of the premier law firms that, that has expertise in the whole area of law firm practice and litigation finance and the like. And um, Boris happens to be the co-head of the firm's finance and derivatives practice and runs the global litigation finance practice for that firm. And he's the one who works with these other gentlemen and, and helps envision where to go next or how to put deals together and how to manage risk and the like, and, and has a great deal of knowledge and expertise. Justin Brass is also New York based. He's the co-head 
of litigation funding group for Stiefel Nikolaus, which is a, a major investment uh, banking firm in this space. And uh, I, I, I asked uh, Justin for his bio and he said, um, before he moving to the business side. And I, when I hear the word business side, I'm thinking of George Lucas and maybe this is the next, this is the next episode in, in the Star Wars from the dark side to the business side. It feels that way sometimes. I know, I'm sure. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, and, and prior, to, uh, prior to going to the business side, uh, Justin clerk for Judge Drain in the Southern District of New York Business uh, Bankruptcy Court and was a lawyer at, uh, at Paul Weiss. Um, and over the last five years, he's put together $5 billion in different types of financing in this space. So this is not a neophyte. We're bringing people to you who have actually been in the trenches making this stuff happen and do every day. And finally, Andrew Mutter, which is, uh, uh, who lives in, based in Tennessee, by the way, he's the co-head of CAC Specialty Contention and Risk Litigation Risk Team. Um, and it's a, CAC is a specialty insurance broker that deals with very complex business risk and has a special um, group, which uh, Andrew is co-head of, that, that uh, provides expertise in de-risking uh, litigation finance transactions. And we'll learn about that whole area of how you de-risk or, or spread risk um, in, a, in, a, in a funding of litigation finance. And in his experience, he's done over $3 billion in, in, in uh, financing. So. These people are both are all very experienced, and, and I'm going to give you an introduction and probably sit down and shut up because you want to hear from them, not from me. But I, I think preliminarily, um, it would be very helpful, I see, to, to put this more esoteric capital markets of litigation finance in some context. So I'm going to attempt to do that and then, and then turn it over to the panel. So, um, so view from an economic filter, a claim in, lawsuit, in a lawsuit is a contingent asset, quote unquote, from an economic standpoint. That is at the end of the case, in a civil litigation case, primarily, all that happens is there's an exchange of money or not. So if the plaintiff wins the case, the defendant or the defendant's insurer gives money to the plaintiff and the plaintiff's lawyer. So there's money involved at the end, or if they lose, they don't. And, the, and the, uh, the, there's a risk, that's the risk associated with this. Secondly, pursuing litigation is very expensive. It costs a lot of money. You have the plaintiff's lawyers, you have experts, and you have various other types of uh, cost involved in litigation. The defense has lawyers, and people never recognize this, but I want you to tell you, we're all paying for this because the court system exists Without the court system and the judges and the, and the courthouses and the bailiffs and the bailiffs and the clerks, there wouldn't be any of this. And who's paying for that? The taxpayer. So we all have a stake in whether or not this thing works or doesn't work. Um, uh, so, so where do you get the money? If I have a claim, where do I get the money to, to drive a case, a claim in a, in a lawsuit? And, and, and I can tell you that there's very few people, maybe nobody sitting in this room who has the money to actually sit down and bring a case and fund it themselves out of their own pocket. If you if you can do that, I can assure you, you don't want to do that. Okay, <laughs> all right. And 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 why? Because because nobody knows how much it's going to cost. Nobody knows how long it will take, and nobody can assure you what the outcome is going to be. So if you want to step up and put some money into something, those are the factors. And what litigation funders haven't been able to do, and this is the this is the. Uh, our free market system in America that makes us a great system is we innovate. And what, what's happened is we've done innovate, there's been innovation and, and among financiers, among lawyers and the like to come up with a mechanism to, to create a source of funds to actually have access to the court system and to give somebody who's got a claim an opportunity to go jump in and actually be a, a litigant. Um, uh, so, so, what, we, what, what we're talking about is what, what are referred to among many of us as contingent assets. That is, we have, there's an asset maybe at the end of this case, and it's contingent on a lot of things that many of us have no control over, but we're going to get there sooner or later, we hope anyway. Um, so how did this, so, so how do we, how did this, this insurance uh, securitization, capital markets piece 
which is not a new concept in the, in the American economic system. How did it get developed? How did it develop so that it could be adapted to litigation finance? And I'm gonna ask you, Boris, to start this out by giving us some background on what the different sectors are in litigation finance and how this has evolved over the past 15, 10, 15 years, okay? Yeah, thanks. sure, thanks, Alan. Um, the, the notion of uh, across, crossing capital markets with litigation risk and insurance is actually, is not new. It's actually been around a long time. Um, starting with the side of litigation funding that is, has really not been discussed and usually isn't discussed in, at these conferences and frankly is not considered litigation finance by many, which is the consumer side of the business colloquially called presets, uh, where uh, many of you may be familiar with it, but basically specialty finance company make relatively small ticket advances to thousands um, of claimants. That's not technically litigation finance, because those claimants don't actually use the money for the litigation. They use the money for whether it's medical bills or, or their uh, rent or whatever their personal expenses might be. But the risk that the party giving them the money takes is the same. It's the risk that the litigation will be successful. And it's binary risk in any case, just like in the single event commercial case, that if that case is a loser, they don't get any of that money back. And that's sort of colloquially called presets. But that business has been around a long time. And uh, it took a while for that to become a bankable business. But ultimately, uh, a long time ago, at this point, it did become a bankable business where Banks were lending, and by the way, to this day, continue to lend to those businesses at roughly mid-single digit uh, rates. And so then the question became, well, how do you then take that to the capital markets? And because those, those credit lines that were, had become available to those specialty finance companies aren't limitless. Um, and so when you fill up the line, well, what do you do with it? Well, that's where the securitization comes in, right? Because what is a securitization is you basically uh, take that same pool of assets, which in this case are these uh, advances, which are thousands of advances because they're small. So if you if you did a hundred million dollar securitization, you're talking about seven, eight, nine, ten thousand individual uh, fundings uh, going into a transaction where securities are issued backed by those receivables and are rated by a rating agency. And so you have rated bonds that are basically sold in the capital markets. When that started to happen, um, in order for the rating agencies to be able to rate those deals, they, it was hard for them to get their arms around uh, the business. Not so much um, the uh, risk because unlike in commercial cases where it's very choppy and it could be very lumpy, when you have 10,000 individual fundings, you could actually, you can have current interest, unlike in many commercial cases, you can have current interest and uh, predictable cash flows that you can model and you have historical information. You can run static pool analysis, um, but it was still too new and the history was not sufficiently there. So what did we have? We had insurance. We had monoline insurance or similar insurance that provided coverage on the transaction, but it was different because it it didn't uh, insure each individual funding. It didn't insure the case. It insured the bonds. It ensured that the bonds would pay current interest, ultimate principal, or ultimate principal rating agencies rate current interest and ultimate principal, and that's where the cross section of insurance and litigation risk really developed and that has been around a long time ultimately that wasn't needed anymore because there was enough history had developed that you can do um preset securitization without insurance and there have been many securitizations uh executed without uh insurance of that sort and then more recently where you had companies like cac uh put together products for the commercial side of the space where you are in fact insuring the underlying litigation risk directly in some way, whether it's because you're insuring a certain amount of cash flow, you're insuring uh, a judgment or whatever it might be, you actually are insuring 
of the actual underlying asset. And so that's really historically how we ended up. At so, this but, point. but I think, so, sorry, I, Alan, just one, just one point on that, that uh, just to tie it into a, a, di a different way is that the, um, you know, litigation funding and litigation funding type arrangements have been around in the bankruptcy context um, for a, a, a long time. And in fact, it, just because it was news, it was news this week regarding a decision in the Affordable Care Act um, where uh, some of the entities that were participants, these, these healthcare co-ops that were participants in the Affordable Care Act programs that were pursuing litigation, in fact, either sold their claims or um, you actually had state entities and, and the state of Illinois, I think, was one of them where um, the, the land of Lincoln healthcare co-op um, went out and put out an RFP for litigation funding uh, in order to pursue their claim, which, which in which they they eventually they eventually prevailed regarding the risk corridor claims, and so we see that in 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 the distress context, and it, it's it's something that as it's it's interesting to hear some of the objection um, from the previous panel, and in a little bit more of the commercial context. But this is this is something that has actually been around and been before courts uh, for a long period of time. It's just in the bankruptcy context, it's creditors who are kind of delaying uh, a distribution and funding a litigation trust or getting other means to fund a litigation trust. So it, it's really been it's really been out there for, for quite some time at this point. Let me ask you, Andrew, and I, I, I think I neglected to mention you're a lawyer and you practice law That's right. for many years as well. But uh, uh, how do you how do you apply your expertise as a, as a, an insurance space? to different opportunities that exist in the, what we call the, the corporate or the, uh, the commercial uh, litigation space? What types of things do you look at and how do you, how do you evaluate those? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, I think uh, kind of tying it into what we're talking about here, what you have with litigation finance from our perspective, um, as we've been developing these, these solutions is an asset that, um, is uh, like maturing as an asset class and being seen by different stakeholders in different ways as sort of the history of it matures, the data around it matures, and you can be relied upon in some sort of way. Um, and at the same time, you have attention with, you know, all kinds of sources of capital that may not understand that asset very well. Um, I don't have the underwriting capability to figure out what this pool of legal assets is really worth and what kind of cash flow it really is going to throw off and critically how fast, right, um, and so forth, um, or even a single matter, you know, understanding what that legal asset really is, can I lend against it, um, et cetera. And so what we've focused on at CAC from the beginning is providing in particular the broking services that have been lacking in the space to uh, analyze these risks well and apply our legal training role former corporate litigators um, to kind of set things up well for insurance underwriters who are very, very busy and have low bandwidth uh, so that they can get up to speed quickly on the case. They are also um, former lawyers um, and most of them former litigators. Uh, and then the insurance product is ultimately is sort of an outsourced way of underwriting for people who want to invest in this asset class by signaling that this is a safe asset or at least up to a certain point is a safe asset. Um, and that is going to be guaranteed ultimately some kind of, whether it's cash flow over a time period or upon final resolution, be at least worth X amount of dollars. Um, we're taking that um, uh, uncertainty and making it more certain, as you said earlier, um, uh, Alan. And, and so that's a, a big part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is working with the insurance community to analyze, understand legal assets so that they're, you know, among other things, um, providing that diligence for investors that would like to invest. So anybody want anything? We'll go to the scenarios if we're still sure. wanting. Okay. So what we did was we put together some scenarios of real world situations and from which we can have the panel explain how they would approach solving the problem as a way to illustrate for each of you what really happens in the real world. So I will read them and and uh, and uh, I'm gonna have you answer the first one, Boris, if you will, or, or start the conversation. It's gonna be an interactive conversation. So Access Funding is a litigation funder. 
and it has amassed a portfolio over the past 18 months uh, and has invested in $150 million in 40 transactions. Now it's getting close to exhausting its capital and Access would like to uh, raise another $150 million in fresh capital in some form. So I ask you what, what capital markets or insurance solutions might Access Open Access Funding consider now that they have a portfolio of 150 million and they want to raise another 150 million. So whoever wants to start with that, answer that question, Boris. Well, you, I mean, in, in your, in this scenario, they have a, a, a financeable asset right. um, already. And so they could certainly use their existing financeable portfolio to raise capital, the proceeds of which they can use um, to originate new cases. Is a little bit of a nuance there because it also depends if there's continuing funding obligations on the original portfolio. But putting aside the excess over that, they can certainly use um, to originate the new portfolio. The question, I think, is to whom can they go to raise that capital secured by uh, the existing portfolio? And so you really have um, one universe of potential capital providers, which are... Um, you know, either hedge funds, private equity funds, um, high net worth family offices and things like that, where they can certainly hive off some sort of piece of that portfolio and monetize it. So let me ask, let me ask, uh, Justin, let me ask you, this is now I've, I'm, I'm the CEO of Open Access Funding and I call you and I say, I've got this portfolio and I need 150 million more. What can, what, 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 how would you react to that? What would you tell me? Yeah, I think the, the the first thing we would do is is uh, we we'd work with you to understand the the cases and and it really really take a look of, of the existing cases. Where are they on the litigation timeline? And and, and obviously, um, uh, you know, litigation funders do a tremendous amount of work and and invest in cases that are you know pre motion to dismiss, sometimes even pre complaint. Um, that it, that in and of itself is is incredibly risky. And there are a lot of investors that simply that simply won't do that, and and that's why you know litigation funders can can get the types of returns that that uh, that they do because they're taking tremendous risk. Once cases have reached a certain level of maturity, you can actually go into the market and and look at the cases and look at the 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 costs that have gone into the case and the investment into the case, and then assert that there's some type of premium. At that point, if it's past motion to dismiss, if it's approaching trial, um, if other if other you know key issues of uncertainty uh, have already been resolved, uh, you can go out and say, okay, well at this point, at this point, the funder took a risk and they were maybe entitled to you know let's just say a, a four to five x type type return. Well, when they go into the market, depending on what the risk is left, maybe that's something that should price at a max of a two to three X return. And especially then if you're looking at the entire portfolio with each additional case, you're reducing the binary nature of the investment. Um, that should also then reduce the return because you're reducing the risk. So we would look at the portfolio like that and then work to come up with, with our expected timing and, and, and internal rate of return. Um, and if there were certain things that were still risky, um, you know, we would call Andrew and say, <laughs> and say, you know, hey, there's, you know, one, th one thing that that just kind of ties into is something that, that Andrew and I did work on together was there was a risk in a patent case that we were looking at, and it was a binary risk, but you could look at the data that was out there and see that, you know, 98% of the time, this particular motion was denied. Um, but the we were willing to take the risk and maybe lose half of our half of our capital that we were going to invest in the deal, but it just couldn't be a binary result. And so we actually worked with with CAC to to diligent to diligence it and then um, create insurance on that one particular risk. So as soon as the case progressed beyond that motion or settled, the insurers were off risk. So um, Andrew. I, I don't. I, hopefully, I didn't. Let, let me let me do this. Scenario. Let me read the next scenario because this is something. It's a continuation of the first one, and I think this is now gets more into the meat of what you'd be interested in. But you can tell you can tell us if I'm not correct. So now, open access funding has raised the 150 million, 
and has placed it in new funding transactions. So now you're, you're three years from the initial placement of funding by open access. The first 18 months was fund one, and now you've, you're, you've now completed, you're 18 months later, and you've, you've placed the other 150. And you've recovered already a total of $75 million of the total of 300 million that you've placed. Uh, and, uh, and you've had an 85% success rate. Now you want to de-risk the remaining 225,000, 225 million, excuse me, <laughs> invested by the two funds. What would you do with this opportunity? How would you approach it? Uh, as, as now you're the insurance and you can discuss what you would do with the first scenario as well, Andrew. Yeah, no, that's great. So, I mean, in that situation, it, 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 the easiest thing to, to assume is that in the first transaction, no insurance was placed. Um, just because it gets complicated if the collateral is already tied up, tied up with, with some kind of insurance. Um, but, uh, we, you know, we we often get approached in scenarios and, the, you know, you sort of have two different reasons why insurance typically is a very attractive uh, play, especially on a programmatic basis with funders and investors. Um, one is that it, it reduces maybe concentration risk, right? That it, all a bet in a, one big kind of um, investment uh, has a binary outcome and you can defray some of that. The, the second is that it's somehow normally a cost of capital play and a way to accelerate returns. Um, uh, so in this situation, you know, you have uh, 225, is that, is that right? Yes. 225 million in investments. Um, you know, we we work with the insurance markets to wrap that and say, after you know, thorough diligence, that um, we get to a high degree of confidence that this portfolio, especially since it's sort of a diverse portfolio of multiple investments in some early stage, some later stage cases, is going to you know realize potentially 125 million, at least return the principal um, within the next you know, three to four years. You, you should, all these things are negotiable as to how you want to frame it and how you want to structure it. Normally, the most important aspect is from the lender's perspective, what is it that's actually going to get them comfortable and be willing to lend at a lower cost of capital or access a different kind of investor that maybe historically wouldn't invest in this asset class unless it's in a wrapped basis. And um, in that situation, you can, if you're the, the, the funder, you can accelerate those returns um, at, with a much lower cost. So how much would you insure of my 225 million in, in money placed? How much would you insure? Uh, Roughly, give me a ballpark. In, a <laughs> right now in the market and it's something we're working on, uh, the, the, the insurers are understandably concerned about taking principal completely off the table. So, you know, there, there is no retention whatsoever, and uh, maybe we're even insuring part of your return, not just not just the um, the, the investment, the basis that you have in an investment. Um, ironically, they're willing to do that in other circumstances. We can talk about it. They're not. It's not like very rational all the way through uh, the insurance markets. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, yeah, frustratingly, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but so typically in that situation, 225 million, you, know, you normally insure, try to insure as close to 100% of it as possible. And on that basis, you can do a couple of different things. It's a secondary market transaction that could be really interesting from a number of players. You know, you might find uh, somebody who's willing to lend, you know, uh, the full 225 million on the basis of just their principal being protected, right? Or and obviously that would have a higher return for them and they'd be getting a bigger piece of the upside of, the, of the, the, this portfolio. Or you could potentially go and uh, you know just uh, have a have a much lower advance rate and you know basically guarantee the lender that they're going to get their principal back plus some amount of their return. And how let me ask example. let me ask you a question of you, Justin. How would you take this opportunity now? You have some kind of an insurance wrap on it, and where would you go with that? Yeah, I think with the with the insurance wrap, it, it opens up the universe of investors. So you can really look to what we would look to and 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 what what Andrew would would no doubt provide is um an ins an insurer with a high quality uh rating, either you know, with AM, AM best, you know, let's just say AM best A rating. And so then what that helps facilitate is you can then go into the market to a different universe of investors that may not need um as much of a return because they're they're looking through a lot of the investment to the to the underlying uh, to the underlying insurance provider and uh, and looking at their principal protection. 
Um, if there's also a good argument regarding the cash flows and and the timing of those cash flows, um, you know that could reduce that could reduce the cost even further. But it, just as by way of example, um, we worked on uh, on an opportunity. If, if people remember the, the initial portion of COVID and until I, I guess about 12 months ago, you know rates were incredibly low. Um, so the high the high yield index was returning about four percent. And so for many insurers and other people with just tremendous amounts of capital that they need to earn a return that's really, you know, um, in excess of 6%, um, things that were higher yielding were in short supply. And so at one point in time, we we worked with CAC to get a wrap on a portion of an investment that the investors actually paid for the insurance. Um, it resulted in a lower yielding investment of uh, it, it, the net the net rate to investors was six percent. But again, because of that spread over the high yield index, it was a very attractive opportunity and it allowed those participants to to outperform perform their peers. So we think that those um, those opportunities are there. I think the one thing where um, people have to be cautious where if they haven't dealt a lot with in, with insurance is it's not really some people will will, try to approach the insurer um, really too late in the process, almost as if a, in, in the greater fool theory of, well, let me try to find somebody where I can push off this risk. And um, just with the amount of work that, that these guys do, that's that's pretty transparent. Also, it, it's something that would then eventually lead to the closure of the market to you um, for, for closing future, future opportunities like that. So I think it's very important to, um, when considering something like this, to be transparent, both about the strengths and weaknesses um, of the particular opportunity, so so that everyone's going into it with eyes wide open, and that, that's also going to be reflected. Not to get too much into the nuance of it, but that also you know has an impact on on what exclusions and how exclusions are drafted in a particular policy. There's also I just would add that uh, when we're talking about expanding the universe of investors, there's some investors, for example, that cannot invest in something that doesn't carry a rating right. of some sort. They just can't, right? So what if you can take insurance on a tranche of some sort then and use that to rate that tranche, which you can't do because the rating agency will simply look through to the rating of the insurance, that now opens up the universe of uh, capital sources that actually need that rating. For example, there are some insurance companies that might do it, but they have to have a rating because they have to have, they have regulatory capital. They have to keep depending on the NAIC rating that's a, a, attributed to their investment. That's one. The other is there's also a universe of investors who like the uh, yield that the asset class offers. They like the uncorrelated nature of the risk, but they don't understand it. Right? They don't have the capacity to underwrite this risk. And having insurance gives them the ability to invest in something based on the insurance, the insurance, somebody already on the road that risk that they don't have to uh, do as much themselves in something that's less familiar. We go on to the next uh, scenario and I'll, I'll let either one of the three of you jump in uh, to start the, the discussion. So Better Systems Company has won a judgment in the amount of $90 million in a copyright infringement and trade secrets case. The defendant has just filed an appeal and posted a bond. Better Systems is looking at a 24 month horizon until this appeal is over. And they'd like to raise some capital using their judgment as their asset. Again, using the word asset here, quote unquote asset. And um, what would you do with this opportunity? How would you shape the terms and what kind of options do you see for better systems to raise the funding? I, I think, Alan, that the first step is we call you, given your expertise <laughs> uh, scenario. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so um, one area in which uh, sort of contingent risk in particular took off starting about three years ago um, was precisely this scenario. Um, uh, in which you have a judgment, um, and uh, there's a lot of times you'll, you, you're faced with clients who've been litigating for years. I've got one client's been litigating for literally a decade, um, and uh, you know finally have you know some affirmation of all of that effort. Uh, they've been doing it in conjunction with litigation finance, supporting them along the way. But obviously, litigation funders in this space would know that a, a ten-year uh, 
uh, time horizon on your investment is quite a long time period. Um, and, and, and you're still facing, you know, three, potentially, potentially 24, but maybe as long as three years of additional uh, time before you see a, a penny of the judgment. You could get remanded. You, you could have all kinds of things that, that, that happen. In that situation, assuming this is a high quality judgment, it's a critical assumption, this doesn't work for everybody and for every, for every claim. Um, uh, the insurance markets can look at the judgment and potentially find the core value that they'll say at the, at, upon final adjudication, this judgment's going to, re to return at least you know, X million dollars. And that's only some, some you know, fraction of what the actual judgment is um, in exchange for a premium. Now, once that's been done, just sort of the theme of what we've been talking about, you now have an A-rated asset. It's no longer contingent assets, an A-rated asset. And then go to the uh, capital markets and say, you know, lend against this, right? You, you're, you're, you're guaranteed a return here um, uh, and guaranteed your principal. Uh, and that oftentimes is a very it's a efficient and less expensive option for clients that allows them to, um, uh, and the funder that's invested, to, to bring money forward now um, and accelerate some, at least some of their returns now. For strategic use, I, I would say two comments. Number one, having done a little bit of this in my life, is that um, many times the litigation funder will go put up a chunk of money to, in this case, better systems, and then go to Andrew and saying, "Would you insure my risk?" Therefore, bringing down the risk for the funder, yeah. and it's happening in the real world. That's what's happening in the real world to some degree, anyway. And I mean, my, my no, I think just it's you know once you involve insurance, and I, I think that I think what all of us have been involved involved in here has really been more institutionalization of the asset class, and 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 as Alan mentioned, it's these these things are really are really assets, and and until recently haven't been open to the same type of financing opportunities, um, you know that that other assets would be, but that is gradually. Um, that's gradually shifting with use of insurance. It's gradually shifting. You know, we syndicate our deals. So um, by syndicating, we're able, we're able to push the cost of capital uh, off to push the cost of capital down because it eliminates some of the huge just single investment risk. If, if someone was doing a three hundred and twenty million dollar deal, um, any one person doing that deal, it would just simply be too large of an exposure. But if you syndicate that across many investors. Um, it can still it can it can still work. So I think you know as you lead into that, you you get into more things like premium financing, where um, the the solution may be not that better systems goes out and and um, and it, and it does they they get the insurance and then they don't take funding against it, but maybe they only get premium financing. Um, and the premium financing is an attractive opportunity because again you can see how much. How much equity cushion is is there because of the insurance policy? So that's something else that's really, I think, increased on the on the backs of this. But Andrew, I, I mean, I, I think that's really um, grown tremendously over the last eighteen months. I think yeah, there's absolutely. there's another technique in that same context. If you have a very very large deal, and I'd like you to comment on this, Boris, is that if you have a very very large transaction. Let's say it's a hundred million dollar opportunity to fund business, and 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 you say, well, I've got a portfolio, but I don't want to put a hundred million dollars of risk in that deal um i would go to another uh, colleagues in the space one or two or th whatever colleagues and say would you like to take a participation and share the risk with my company and and that happens now in bigger deals more than you think and and although we're competitors unquote with one another there's a certain collegiality because everybody can nobody's gonna own the universe here even the burford people you don't own the universe but you have a big chunk of it. But this is what's going on, and it allows um, smaller funds to take to, to be active in a, in the large transaction space. And so, what do you? What do you? How would you? Who would you represent in that context? And and how do you? What is your role in that, Boris, if at all? Oh, oh well, we represent anybody who hire us. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not that picky. Uh, uh, but we've re we've done actually many transactions like it. I mean, we represent either side, either. Uh, typically, it will either you can represent all the participants because sometimes there are uh, conflicts across uh, participants. But we either represent the capital, so one or more of the participants, or the 
uh, funder that's participating out um, the uh, opportunity. Uh, but that's done very commonly. And uh, there, you can do that actually in a variety of ways. And you could also ensure uh, subsections of it. And one of the things that I, maybe I'm sure is coming across is that because it's specialty insurance, it's not one size fits all, everything's bespoke. So in fact, you, you can insure uh, one sleeve uh, Alan, from the or, uh, scenario, or you can insure two. And by the way, if you insure two, that you don't actually have to insure both of them in the same way, mm -hmm. right? So you can have a minimum, you can have a minimum and a maximum, or you, you can have uh, a whole uh, sort of quilt uh, of um, insurance. And so it really, uh, the combination gives you a way to, uh, again, bring in different types of capital, but different slugs of the same investment. So the, the point of a lot of this discussion is that and I'm sure it's becoming clear to you that this is becoming a very sophisticated asset class as an economic asset, much more so than was the case. I can promise you that 10 or 15 years ago. And it's a function of the fact that the space has grown in terms of the, the amount of money out there and the size of the deals out there and the acceptability of litigation financing among law firms and among plaintiffs and, and big companies even. And they're looking for ways to de-risk or lower the risk and lower the cost ultimately of what it costs to fund the deal for the, for the law firm or whatever. So we're gonna to move to the law firm now. And we're gonna look at it from the standpoint of the law firm is now seeking money, okay? And I'll have another, this is the, you know, we have two, two uh, two more uh, scenarios, and then we'll take some questions. So um, this one, I think, Boris, I promised you this, and, and uh, uh, I'll read it. The law firm of Regal and Big is a well-established large business litigation firm. To enhance its potential fees and better align its interests with its clients, the firm has taken on five litigation cases under a blended fee arrangement, okay? Um, and that is a way to for, for lawyers to, to align themselves with their clients as opposed to an hourly rate, in my view, okay? Uh, the fee arrangement provides that the law firm will receive 50% of its regular hourly rate each month, and if successful in each case, it will receive 20% of the amount recovered. Um, Reland Big has told you that the potential recovery in the five cases will be $30 million total recovery on a conservative basis and potentially up to $600 million its potential fee in the aggregate will be 45 million or more. Um, Regal and Big are looking for funding of $9 million over the next 24 months to help fund the firm. What would you do with this opportunity? How would you shape the terms and what options do you see for Regal and Big to fund the case? And Boris, we'll start with you. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as a, as a firm, the only thing we really have to offer uh, a funder are our fees. Uh, you know, we don't have anything else. That's why, in fact, this was mentioned uh, at one of the panels. Somebody mentioned a, a very poorly thought out New York City bar uh, opinion from a few years ago that made a, a distinction between recourse and non recourse lending to law firms. And I was wondering, you know, what would be the difference given that we don't actually have anything other than our fees? You know, we don't sell cups or mugs or t shirts or anything else. It's just all we have is our fees. But so, we would uh, uh, bring in uh, a lender for that uh, portion of it, typically on a non-recourse uh, basis uh, to give us some advance against that future $9 million. Uh, that that funder might or might not want to look at an insurance solution if they're not comfortable with taking the risk itself to try to um, de-risk based on what they think the outcome of the case uh, might be. But I think we would, you know, this isn't a particularly sophisticated uh, instrument, but we would use our fees as as the collateral for the funding. To be, so, yeah, Justin, what would you do with that? Well, I think the the other thing that that um, that we've offered to borrowers at different points in time is that while the contingency fee book may be smaller, you can you can actually reach an arrangement with the firm where depending on on what their uh, you know what their hourly caseload works like that they that they'll agree to use a portion of those fees to provide some type of minimum cash flow 
over um uh, you know over the early stage of the cases so that way as it, so so that way um you can end up reducing the rate because you're you're de-risking a little bit over time and you have you know a much smaller pool a much smaller pool of collateral um that may not be tied that isn't purely tied to uh contingency fee risk so uh you know we'll work with the potential firm to see where their where their comfort lies and and, and there a, a lot of times they only want to just deal with the with the contingency um portfolio and and not tie up any other parts of the business but um there's tremendous flexibility now i mean any you know what we definitely try to do is 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 understand the firm's needs and and um try to come up with a creative structure to to solve for that if uh, if it's not something that's that's the norm and, and by the way it actually gets more complicated to something you were just saying in terms of ex exposing other uh revenue producing uh cases um is that not all firms are structured the same way and so uh, some firms are you know operate although fewer and fewer these days as a true sort of partnership and some have silos and those silos have pnls and um so at the econo economic drivers that are not necessarily driving the firm but driving subsets of groups and businesses and practice areas and all of that matters so like that solution you know would work could better for example if it's sort of one shop but to but for somebody to has more than one pnl to tell another pnl right that you have to yeah. risk your uh, uh in order to uh collateralize somebody else's is hard so it also just very much driven by how the the firm is structured as well yeah and so in in the situation you're offering up i mean in that situation insurance could potentially work uh five cases is normally about the minimum um for like kind of creating a diversified pool of especially commercial litigation um uh because you want to you want to present to the to the insurance markets uh, roughly an argument that we have five cases uh, they have a variety of sort of chances of ultimate success um if you win if the firm wins on two of them that normally you know that's enough to take the whole insurance structure off risk and that's the kind of bet that they're willing to to make i just want to get the last one in so we know oh, yeah, the time. okay um so this, the next one is not about five cases it's a different uh type of law firm uh, this is swift and smart as a well-established mass tort and class action law firm through firm marketing they've signed up 3,000 clients who have lost their homes in a massive wildfire the average value of the homes is three hundred and fifty thousand dollars the cause of the fire is still under investigation but there's significant evidence that the local utility company caused the ignition that produced the fire this may sound a little familiar to some people okay <laughs> Uh, Swift and Smart are seeking a loan, a line of credit facility of $75 million to fund the firm's expenses for these claims and for additional marketing to sign up more clients. Uh, Justin, what would you do with that situation? And I'll ask the other panelists the same question. Sure. So I think at the at the outset, especially if it, you know, in an early stage case, what we do is in our discussions with the firm, we'd want to understand what uh, what the rest of their contingency book looks like. Obviously, um, while it's it's still unknown um, how the how the wildfire started, uh, you know, if you don't look to the other other fee pools, basically the other lines of cases, uh, you would probably you would probably end up pricing yourself out because you would be looking at it similar to how you would look at another single line of cases, binary risk that would be priced in a very expensive manner. So what we'd like to do is is, is look at the entire book of the firm um, on a non-recourse basis in order to provide you know, the lowest interest rate, understanding that you know, things may or may not work out with this case, but that there's going to be um, other lines of cases and different torts that are gonna be in various stages that give us comfortable, that will, that give us comfort that will at least get our principal back. And the, and the other thing uh, also, with all of these sort of fundings, you, you have, can't forget the notion of a budget. Uh, you have to fund to some sort of budget and this what you're describing here, which is a really a, a case acquisition facility, you know, to think about what is the acquisition cost per case and how much are you willing to lend against each case effectively because that's what you're doing you're aggregating thousands but really one at a time yeah and what would happen over the course of time is is as you're funding you you want to see the metrics on 
how many cases are they signing up? What's getting kicked out due to dual representation because there are you know, 10 firms marketing for the same pool of clients. Um, so you'd wanna see how the firm tracks those statistics. And, and, and I think the, the larger firms um, in this space have a lot of, uh, are very sophisticated and, and have full accounting departments, CFOs who can get all this information for you at the punch of a button. Um, you know, it, it, as you go smaller scale, it becomes more risky there there you know if some of these firms that are that are smaller don't have a cfo or internal accounting department even and and um and then you're running a real risk that someone can get out ahead of themselves so we'll we'll be looking for those things as we're scheduling the future advances and and the future draws will be discretionary um and and, and we'll want to make sure that uh you know hurdles are being met and, and the dollars are going the right way the other thing I would just I'll let you speak in a minute. One of the things that happens also is that there may be 25 other firms that have 50 clients or 75 clients that they don't have the means. So they'll they'll partner with the firm with the 3,000 cases and they'll work on them together. And the firm that's got the cash is going to get a little bit bigger piece of the pie at the end of the day. But this is very fairly common, I would say, yes. in that universe. Andrew, do you want to add something? Yeah. Huh? No, I mean, it, it, as you might imagine, this this is probably a little bit earlier stage for an insurance play, right? Unless unless there's a more diverse yeah. pool of um, other contingency fee cases that this that this firm has, uh, whatever insurance structure was available is yeah. probably going to be pretty expensive and maybe only limited to a small dollar. So let me just let me just add a fact to this because this is what can happen and happens. The case gets settled now, okay. And yep. and now you have three thousand clients that have claims in the settlement, right? Um, and they would like some money if they're allowed to do that in the terms of the settlement. What can you? What is there anybody who's going to go out and put some money into that scenario? Yeah, there there, there definitely are. We won't do that. Um, we won't we won't do that with indi with individuals. Yeah. Um, it's just as. You know, even though we're, we like to say we're kind of just a Midwestern bank and, and um, the reality is that uh, advancing funds like that to an individual plaintiff, it's never going to be a good headline in the Wall Street Journal. Right. Um, and, and even if you, you've done everything the way you're supposed to do it, it's, it's, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to get that to read the right way. So as, as policy for us, like we'll, we'll stay away from it, but there are definitely other parties that will, will do it. But it, 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 it actually kind of brings us uh, full circle. Because right. if you go back right. to where we started, how this business historically started, exactly. this is your classic, not classic because it's a post-settlement case, but it's a consumer side. Exactly. This is yeah. exactly it. Thank you for making my point. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the other thing, uh, you know, to bear in mind is that um, in the even though we're, we're talking about them in the two segments of litigation finance, they're really two separate, in my experience, they're two separate uh, silos for the reason that that was uh, justin mentioned is that the people who are doing that stuff they have their own invest they have their own group advocacy group and their own what have you and and then the the, the commercial people and they have their own advocacy group and their own rules and what have you and they typically don't inter interact very much if at all but they are aware of one another but th they are both available uh, for different segments and in, in the litigation process and to to your point uh, Boris, it all the both of them depend upon the outcome of a lawsuit, essentially, and that's the common thread there. You have a similar division in insurance where carriers that are willing to do more of like a mass tort structure are not the same as the ones who are willing to do a corporate struct corporate B two B litigation. As you might imagine, insurers can often be on the other side of the V in a lot of mass tort action, and that's why we've done a lot of work innovating to create more capacity in the market for that. But the commercial is is much more straightforward. So let me see. If I'll give you some time for questions. Uh, we have a microphone so we can anywhere. So it's just being recorded by uh, and the cyberspace, the, the people in cyberspace here. Your question. Well, um, got it. OK, thank you, David. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned IRR or ROI, which are way terminology you want to use and generate a return. And we're talking about asset classes. So I know that if I buy junk bond, we're looking at double digits. Where are you in that category? Number two, what's your minimum powder? Minimally, 
minimum size of litigation you're willing to handle that hits that target of your IR and your experience? Is there such a dollar amount? And is there a specific mandate of IRR in your firm? I'll let you answer that. Yeah. So, so for us, um, we're fairly flexible and we look at everything just based on the risk. So on the IRRs, I mean, we're, we're looking for, um, you know, I would say 8% is the lowest that we would, that we would go. Um, that's gotta be post settlement and simply a bridge to cash. And so if you were comparing again, like if you're comparing that to when rates were close to zero, um, that's incredibly attractive. So long as you're comfortable with the risk, I mean, on that particular deal, um, where we did that, we were four times covered, and and um, we could withstand we could withstand incredibly punitive reductions um, to the potential to the potential fee pool there, or we covered. Otherwise, you know, on binary risk, just given the nature of it, we're we're looking at returns that are going to be, you know, three three times our money, three hundred percent, four hundred percent, depending on depending on duration. On a more diversified portfolio, it's going to be upper teens and and into and into the twenty. Um, in terms of minimums, uh, everyone is everyone is different. Um, just because of the size of our institution, um, you know, our our smallest investments tend to be in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, and then, you know, but for for litigation funders generally, it runs the gamut to several hundred thousand to to definitely in, in single digit millions. Um, we just don't operate that much in that space. I mean, let me also make a a, a comment. There are very very few scenarios where there's no risk i i don't know of very many i can tell you that and i've i've seen transactions where you think that no risk involved and something pops up including your counterparty may not be an honest player okay and that's one of the risks that runs that you run in this business i can tell you is that sometimes the person on the other side doesn't do what they say they're going to do even if they signed an agreement and then you've got to deal with that so it doesn't happen often by the way it's pretty rare but it does happen so there's no there's no such thing as a, a zero risk litigation finance experience in my view yes curious Andrew does do a lot of casing changing with it when you guys talk about the movie in reference to explosive growth and is it outgrowing and you know new but how many like realistically what what's the size growing to are you talking about 10 and how many how many i'm not sure how many people how much money is being put into this segment huh? how much are your places how much are, how many policies are your, what's the volume yeah i mean i i speak to cac i mean it, so far we've really been doing this for like in earnest getting the concept proved out and carriers on board for the past two years or so and that's three billion dollars in total insurance limits over that time period so and i think it's growing i think especially as portfolio products become more and more acceptable from an underwriter's perspective which we've been advocating very strongly with the markets that those are much better actually than the single matter risks that they're more comfortable with um uh you're going to see even more i think and there are new entrants into the market, but so um, as this, I think, as people got wind of of of, of, of I think CAC's success, um, you know, we hear from from carriers all the time that are are looking to expand their capacity, particularly in, in this space. Just also one more follow up question: I'm just curious the ratio of things that are brought to you for potential insurance to things that you actually think are true. <laughs> All of mine are actually all five that, that That's true. Um, uh, yeah, it, it. We were actually kind of just doing some some internal discussions on this uh, as a group the other day, looking through past deals and for deal list leads. Um, yeah, I would say we probably ultimately reject or or advise the client that this is not achievable, or if it's achievable, it's only achievable in this kind of parameter. Like maybe um uh 30 40 percent of the time when we're looking at deals um uh so we, we got we've done a lot with trying to educate our clients who are repeat players such as you know litigation finance groups as to what is achievable um so we're seeing fewer uh harebrained proposals <laughs> but, Tony. yeah um so this is a question not about the economics of the transactions you described but take for example scenario three which i think was an appeals uh and uh, maybe scenario yes. four, 
Um, what I'd like to know is uh, from Andrew, I guess, is uh, in what sense are you limited by the fact that you call what you're doing insurance? I mean, compared to what Justin is doing, I mean, I understand what Justin's uh, entity is not an insurer, but are you an insurer? And if you are, does the fact that there is state law of insurance and an insurance, um, uh, a, there is an insurance commissioner perhaps, uh, and the fact that you know there's the McCarran-Ferguson Act and all that, does it affect at all the transaction? So uh, CSC is not an insurance carrier itself, um, and nor are we like a MGA, man managing general agent, or a broker um, facilitating these transactions between our client and the insurance markets. Um, and it's written on sur what's called a surplus lines basis, which is non-admitted paper in states, which a lot of policies are not, are surplus lines, like public company DNO is a surplus lines. Uh, product, um, a number of you know, professional liability law, like law, um, law firm professional liability policies are not not admitted paper, um, and therefore they 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 have a different kind of regulatory regime, um, and you pay a surplus lines tax as a part of that structure. Yes. Question. Uh, let's, let's get you. Let me just get you a microphone so other people can hear. Um. My experience with insurance, uh, insuring claims was in the international context. And I had a couple of unusual experiences about pricing, which I thought I'd just ask you about. And uh, I, I think with one experience, it was because it's based on the London market, which didn't actually apply in, in the context. It was for security for costs, which in this type of arbitration rarely happens. And for reasons I don't need to explain, we had to get this insurance. Yeah. So it was very, it was 25% yeah. the premium to, uh, so to cover 5 million. But then I was able to get an insurance policy against sovereign risk, against a risky sovereign uh, for one and a half million to insure 40 million of enforcement insurance. So I was so stunned. <laughs> I, now I knew one reason they thought we were gonna lose on jurisdiction. So that, you know, in terms of, I understand how insurers think, but I really, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about pricing and whether, you're seeing an opportunity for international work, given that the London market is, I think, skewing the pricing so much for, at least for this type of insurance. Right. I mean, so AT insurance is historically very expensive. Um, and that's the, the adverse cost. Anytime you're looking to, to show security for cost, that kind of thing, that's the product that you're looking for. Um, and that's because most carriers are writing on a, on a, uh, sort of like book basis, there's, there's a sort of minimum amount of premium they need to get out of a given deal. Um, and uh, there's a lot of structures that, you, that are available there. You can you can increase your premium, but only pay it upon success, right? Um, and there's, it goes, goes over the map, but it's it's priced differently. It's priced less on an actual merits base basis. There's some wiggle room, but not as much as you'll see in the contingent risk market where you can have something that's priced at like 5% or 6%, but that's sort of changing uh, all the way up to 18%, right? Um, and so you you have a variety of, of, of more variety of difference in uh, tailored underwriting in those spaces. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I can't speak to the, to the lending uh, markets on sovereign debt because that's been actually a, a really thorny thing that most underwriters are not willing to undertake. Um, but, uh, you know, I, the market is still developing and pricing is still developing. Um, and we're going to see, I think, a hardening of the pricing market, especially on single matter risks going forward. So we're, we just want to say to summarize, this is a developing universe that is applying as is litigation funding itself is, a, is an evolving universe, how to apply traditional capital markets insurance devices to reduce risk, spread risk, and reduce the cost of this and make more money available in this space is what's evolving. What we try to do today with this, these experts is to give you a peek as to what's going on right now. And I can assure you in another two or three years, there'll be more to say, if not sooner, in this space. And thank you very much.